my friend Bertrand met his wife in the most unusual of circumstances. A coworker of his asked him one day if he could go in his stead to this small town in Germany. So Bertrand agreed to go. While he was there, he also learned that an acquaintance of his that he hasn't seen in a long, long time was also in town, and they decided to get together in a bar that night. The bar was crowded, so they had to wait outside in line. It was cold, so at some point, Bertrand turned around, cupped his hands, and started to blow hot air into them. At that very point, a woman sitting, uh, standing right next to him also turned around, cupped her hands, and blew hot air into them. They both looked at each other and chuckled and started chatting. At that point, the taxi came by, and this woman, Laura, left the bar, but she did not left Bertram's mind. The next day, Bertram was waiting in a bench for the bus that would take him to the train station. The bus was running late, and at that point, he saw a bicycle sharply stopping by right in front of him. It took him about a second to recognize that it was Laura in that bike. So he approached her, they exchanged phone numbers. As of now, they have been married for 10 years, and I recently learned that they are expecting their second child. Where Bertrand tells his story, it is impossible not to imagine the many ways in which he could have failed to meet his wife. What if his coworker hadn't asked him to go to this small town? What if his acquaintance wasn't there or hadn't planned to go to the bar? Or if the bar wasn't crowded? Or if it wasn't cold? Or what if the light had actually been green and such Laura didn't have to stop by in front of the bench? When we let our imagination wander in the mysterious realms of the what ifs, when we imagine alternative ways in which past events could have happened, we engage in what psychologists know as counterfactual thinking, thoughts that are contrary to fact. But what if counterfactual thoughts as not, are not as mysterious as we think they could be? After all, when we think about the many ways in which Bertrand could have failed to meet his wife, we think of some predictable ways in which events could have changed. For instance, we tend to think, what if, for instance, the bus was on time rather than late? Or what if the light was green rather than red? Sometimes we uh, also can engage in other kinds of counterfactual thinking. We might imagine far-fetched possibilities. For instance, we might imagine what happens if the next day Laura had forgotten all about the night before, or what if all of a sudden, gravity changed in this unusual way, such that the bike right in front of Bertrand's bench was rocketed up to the sky, preventing Bertrand forever meeting Laura and marrying her. Why don't we engage in those more far-fetched possibilities? In 1980, cognitive scientist Douglas Hofstadter suggested that maybe the reason why that happened is because our mind have some natural fault lines, systematic ways in which we alter reality in our imagination. Ever since, many cognitive psychologists have engaged in what I call cognitive seismology. It's our scientific attempt to map the mental fault lines of our imagination. One of the most influential cognitive seismologists is Nobel Prize winner Dan Kahneman. In a series of pioneer studies conducted in the 1980s, Kahneman and collaborators presented participants with a number of vignettes that included what they called junctures, causally relevant events that, if undone, would prevent a certain outcome to occur. So, for instance, one of such vignettes depicts the story of this young gentleman who, driving under the influence, uh, uh, driving under the influence, just fails to notice a red light and crashes into an, another car that is coming in the opposite direction and kills the driver immediately. When you ask about the ways in which those events could have happened differently, people tend to normally undo the same events. In fact, people seem to undo events that are uh, abnormal or unusual. Think about, again, the case of Bertrand. 
we tend to think, for instance, what would have happened if the bus had actually been on time? Because being late is a rather unusual event in Germany where buses are so punctual, right? Another possibility is for us to think what would have happened if the light hadn't turned red? But we don't think about these unusual events of gravity changing drastically. Gra gravity usually never changes. So this view, which is sometimes called as the norm theory, had led an enormous amount of research in trying to understand what kinds of thoughts we think counterfactual alternatives to. But in addition to that, psychologists can also wonder why we engage in counterfactual thinking so frequently and so often. And the key to understand why is also to understand when. If you're like me, you normally engage in counterfactual thinking when you're planning to do a certain action and you fail. Oh, if only I had gone to bed earlier, I would have been able to be more relaxed and do better in this exam. Or if only I had stopped at that gas station, I wouldn't have run out of gas now. These kinds of thoughts uh, that are usually better alternative to bad outcomes are known as upward counterfactual thoughts. And in general, when we engage in upward counterfactual thinking, we feel some kind of regret. Now, less often, but sometimes it does occur, we engage in another kind of counterfactual thinking, in which we imagine how good events could have been worse. Had I missed that penalty kick, we would have lost the game. Or had I been in that line right next to me, I wouldn't have been able to get tickets to come to this TED talk. These downward counterfactuals are also usually associated with feelings, but these times these feelings are feelings of relief. Almost 20 years ago, psychologists Neil Rose and Joe Olson generated what they called the, counterfactual, the functional theory of counterfactual thinking. According to this theory, we engage in upward counterfactual thinking because we are preparing to do better in the future. We rehearse alternative ways in which past events could have occurred in order to improve our future performance. Likewise, when we engage in downward counterfactual, when we imagine worse ways in which an event could have happened, we're actually doing that to, make, to feel better about what we achieved or what we attained. The problem with this view is that this is not always the case. Consider the case of Kim. Kim was a flight attendant that was scheduled to fly in the United Airlines uh, Flight 93. The night before, and this is in 2011, September 11, 2001, the night before she called a colleague and asked her if she could switch uh, the turn with her. That prevented her from dying in the crash of the airplane in Pennsylvania. You would think that the fact that she constantly engages in counterfactual thoughts about what would have happened had he not changed the turn the night before would give her feelings of relief. You will be wrong. She's haunted by these counterfactual thoughts over and over again and make her feel incredibly sad and regretful. Or think about this other case in which we engage in counterfactual thoughts about events that we know are never going to be repeated. I'm thinking about the case of Anastasia. Anastasia is a young gymnast who can't help but repeat over and over again in her mind this one mistake she made and that left her paraplegic. Why is she constantly ruminating over and over again this counterfactual thought? She won't be able to walk again, much less to do any gymnastics. What kind of future event is she trying to improve upon? Our thoughts in our lab and with my collaborators is that the reason why these cases appear challenging is because we're getting the function of these counterfactual thoughts wrong. Not all counterfactual thinking allows us to plan for the future or make us feel better about the present. Sometimes counterfactual thinking has a different function. It helps us change our past. But to tell you how that is possible, I need to tell you a little bit about memory. According to the traditional view in memory, when you engage in certain experience and you, have a certain, uh, and you experience a certain event, the information tends to be consolidated, stored, unchanged until the next time that you retrieve it. 
However, in the last three or four decades, it has become pretty evident that every time that you remember a memory, that memory becomes liable and prone to modification. You can actually change a little bit the content of the memory at the time of retrieval. In fact, evidence suggests that every time that you remember a memory, you update it and you edit it a little bit. But so what if engaging in counterfactual thinking is a good strategy for us to change the content of our autobiographical memories at the time of retrieval. To test that possibility, my collaborators and I ask participants to come to the lab and we ask them to think and remember specific autobiographical events that happened to them in the past. A week later, they came back to the lab and we asked them to engage in counterfactual thinking. Half of those memories, they thought alternatives to several times as if they were ruminating. And the other half, they only thought about an alternative, an alternative way in which it could have occurred only once. And then we compare those that were repeatedly simulated versus those that were only simulated once. And what our results suggest is that the more you think about how, another, how a certain event could have occurred, the less likely you think is that your memory could have occurred differently. We suggest that this effect is our memory helping us to come to grips with the past by taking away our attention from possibilities that are very unlikely to have happened. But not everyone is in the same boat as Bertrand. Bertrand was very happy every time that he remembered specific episodes that happened in his past and imagining alternative ways in which those events could have occurred. Sometimes, unfortunately, people are haunted by memories that they would rather not remember. Sometimes people are haunted by counterfactual thoughts that they would rather not have. So the question now is, can we harness the power of counterfactual thinking to change the emotion and the valence of autobiographical memories that we rather not have, autobiographical memories that are um, debilitating and incapacitating? That has been the leading question of our research in the lab for the past year. A pilot study conducted in the lab invited participants to come to the lab and produce a number of autobiographical memories of regretful events in their life. And we asked them to give us some measures of valence and some measures of intensity of emotion. A week later, they asked them to come back to the lab to either engage in counterfactual thinking or just simply re-remember those events. And a day later, they come back and we ask them to remember the events once again. And we measure the valence and the intensity of those memories. That would allow us to compare the memories once reactivated to the original memories. Although preliminary, our results suggest that engaging in counterfactual thinking about negative events that could have been better changes a little bit the valence of those memories in a way that is different from just merely reactivating them in memory. Conversely, Engaging in counterfactual thinking about positive memories changes the intensity with which we feel those emotions. Our hope is to harness what we learn from the mechanisms about counterfactual thinking in the context of memory reactivated, to see if we can use that knowledge to change people's memories in a clinical context. The idea is that imagination is a very powerful tool that helps us not only plan for the future and makes us feel better about the present, but also can help us change our memories about the past. Thank you. <laughs>